Although it is a largely secular movement, contemporary transhumanism borrows heavily from both Christian orthodoxy and some of its heresies to construct a vision for human happiness. This presentation traces the roots of transhumanism's pseudo-religious soteriology and eschatology, and then examines the underlying anthropological problems that drive the hoped for salvation through digital immortality. Unfortunately, the admirable desire to extend life sacrifices an appreciation for the harmony of the human person's animal and spiritual dimensions. Since human actions manifest the person's intrinsic corporality, the notion of detaching the human personality from the body through digitalization may produce replicas of the dead without achieving true immortality. The surprising pseudo-religious thrust of contemporary transhumanism's eschatology presents an opportunity to rediscover the cat Catholic patrimony's reflection on authentic divinization through the transhumanizing effects of divine grace. The leading transhumanist philosopher, Oxford University professor Nick Bostrom, thinks that his movement will provide real solutions to the perennial problems of humanity that traditional religions have tried and failed to address. He writes, quote, while not a religion, transhumanism might serve a few of the same functions that people have traditionally sought in religion. It offers a sense of direction and purpose and suggests the vision that humans can achieve something greater than our present condition. Unlike most religious believers, however, transhumanists seek to make their dreams come true in this world by relying not on supernatural powers or divine intervention, but on rational thinking and empiricism through continued scientific, technological, economic, and human development." Unquote. Yet for all its protest against antiquated creeds, secular transhumanism shows a persistent thrust toward religious expressions. For instance, the author Megan O'Giblin finds striking parallels between the evangelical and transhumanist worldviews she has embraced and abandoned during her life. Her writing explores a harrowing transition from Christian fundamentalism to transhumanism and her eventual disillusionment with the techno movement. Bible school had taught her about the various epochs of salvation history and her position within the dispensation of grace that marked the final preparation for the longed for millennial kingdom. As an adult, she spurned the false promises of organized religion and sought a more rational organization for her life. Later, a book recommendation plunged her into the thought of Google guru Ray Kurzweil and his narrative of evolutionary eras pointing toward an imminent singularity in which intelligent machines would emerge from an informational explosion. Such advanced robots would bring digital immortality through mind uploads and a nanotech new earth that would put Eden to shame. Through his projects, Kurzweil purports to continue the enlightenment tradition of empirical science and rational rigor. Similarly, many transhumanists tend to follow their enlightenment predecessors in chi chiding traditional religion for opposition to scientific progress. Nonetheless, O'Giblin discovered that the very movement that pretends to supplant the superstitions of the old time religion is itself, quote, a secular outgrowth of Christian eschatology, unquote. The Christian trained author could not help but detect familiar religious themes in the technocentric movement. Before it spread through the offices of Silicon Valley, the term transhumanism had already appeared in Henry Francis Carey's 1814 version of Dante's Paradiso, where the poet Pilgrim recognizes that not even his own genius can describe the joy of risen life when he writes, quote, words may not tell of that transhuman change, unquote. Recent efforts to substitute supernatural resurrection with technological advancement find antecedents in the 13th century friar Roger Bacon's quest for an elixir of life. Later, the 19th century Russian Orthodox Nikolai Fedorov claims humans should use technology to control and direct Darwin's unguided evolutionary process. Similarly, the 20th century Jesuit paleontologist uh, Pierre Tejard de Chardin predicts a global machine network that would merge consciousnesses worldwide 
and prompt the omega point of transphysical union with the divine. The eugenicist Julian Huxley strips such notions of their religious trappings to present a secular transhumanist project that will overcome limits to arrive at a fuller fruition. Later, the extropians develop another project in the 1980s and prepare the way for Kurzweil's rise to mainstream success with his 2012 appointment as director of engineering at Google. The ersatz religious longings are focused on a moment of singularity in which the merger of our biological thinking and existence with our technology will allow a human state that transcends our biological roots. O'Giblin's drift from the Christian faith proved to be a more devastating exodus than expected. She found it difficult to shake a sense of dread in a closed materialist world. Even her self-identity was, was challenged as she admits that, quote, her body had become strange to her. It seemed insubstantial, unquote. She had to cope with the realization that what she once considered a sacred temple of the Holy Spirit was now a meaningless lump of meat caught up in an unstoppable process of entropy. During late night commutes to the jazz club, she would sometimes experience existential epiphanies, which indicated that there was, quote, no difference between your human flesh and the plastic seat of the train, unquote. Yet some transhumanists promise that this valley of tears will give way to a new heaven. For example, the World Transhumanist Association co-founder David Pierce looks forward to a naturalistic, secular paradise of effectively everlasting happiness that is biotechnically feasible and can be achieved only by the profane application of science, to use his own words. He promotes lofty dreams that privilege hedonistic pursuits through nanotechnical and pharmacological stimulation of pleasure centers for deeper delights. Yet more frequent and sustained bodily stimulations are not enough. The transhumanist paradise seeks to reduce or even eliminate the role of the human body with all of its manifold limitations. As the transhumanist James Hughes predicts, quote, nanoneural networks and psychopharmaceuticals will allow us to modify and enhance sexual and emotional experience to have orgasms as long and hard as we like ideally without engaging our body or the bodies of other people." Unquote. Disembodiment would help overcome any form of psychological dysfunction and refractory periods of normal individuals. Independence from another person's tired and diseased body grants the individual more autonomous control in seeking his self-realization. And a fully virtual experience would remove the risks and disappointments entailed in experiencing pleasures as embodied beings. Although it promises pleasure, the transhumanist worldview has difficulty to living on purpose. The influence of the postmodern suspicion of meta narratives have left many thinkers hesitant to commit to firm convictions about life's meaning that often implicitly underlie specific enhancement projects. Exaltations of autonomy and personal desire fail to guide the use of technology toward constructive rather than destructive ends. Without a clear telos, it is impossible to judge well the meaning of any supposed progress. As Hughes explains, quote, the most common transhumanist cosmology is that the universe is impersonal and purposeless. The emergence of intelligence is a chance occurrence with no inevitability or preordained end. Unquote. Similarly, Pierce argues that widespread genetic defects reflect the absence of any intelligent God in a cruel and chaotic universe. The wayward movement is undergirded by a view of the cosmos without a goal, except those ends invented by its adherents. Without a God as the divine author of the universe, the drama of human life has no story it should follow. Each author weaves a tale subject to constant revision and with no firm hope of arriving at a happy ending. The cosmic orphan should set aside the restraints of religion to embrace perfection through his own efforts. Kurzweil tries to evade despair through his vision of patternism, according to which our identities are patterns of matter and energy that can be mapped and then reassembled on different platforms, on biological clones, non-biological robots, or eventually some form of a network. 
Alternatively, Bostrom takes some solace in knowing that we might be part of a simulation run by benevolent, godlike posthumans who could resurrect or upgrade us to superior states of ongoing life. However, such a matrix-like narrative of a, our illusory existence and cybernetic future seems to require more faith than the Christian vision of salvation history. O'Giblin confesses that, quote, elemental hope that the tumult of the world was authored in intelligence and that a broken body would be restored, unquote, found expression in a movement that for all its techno jargon often lacks evidence for its wild claims. With the melancholy sorrow of her second deconversion, she acknowledges that, quote, I had disavowed Christianity, and yet I had spent the past 10 years hopelessly trying to recreate its visions by dreaming about our post-biological future, a modern pantomime of redemption, unquote. O'Giblin suspects that her temporary flirtation with transhumanism may have resulted from her desire to embrace the attractive promise of transcendent transformation under the thin veneer of science. Transhumanism appears to offer an account of the world that is more respectable to modern, the modern age's sensibilities than traditional religion. Yet ironically, this system demands more faith in its unfulfilled promises than many ancient religions require. Transhumanism, it seemed to her, was vainly attempting to offer through science the very transcendent hope in redemption that science's advances had rendered obsolete. This intriguing wavering between atheistic nihilism and pseudo-religious eschatology has prompted the philosopher Michael Burdett to classify the movement as a kind of atheism 3.0, bent on salvaging a sense of shared identity and destiny in a world where belief in God is apparently unreasonable. The new atheism of the early 2000s, or Atheism 1.0, makes strident critiques of the philosophical and scientific incoherencies of traditional religions. For the new atheist, religious believers are not just wrong, they are dangerous. Faith provides a cover for groundless assertions that countenance fanatical behavior. Moreover, the authoritarian restrictions of religious codes frustrate human well-being. Believers should be refuted, and roundly mocked lest they infect future generations with their anti-humanism. While the first wave of contemporary atheism was seen as a necessary rejection of false ideas and unhealthy lifestyles, the abolition of religion seemed to leave a gap in guidance for how to live together as a community. Then, a form of atheism 2.0, pioneered by Alan de Bottom, arrived to rescue the positive aspects of religion's formative power. Atheistic church-like museums and secular sermons could give clear lessons on how to live a satisfying daily life apart from God. However, the life hacks, homespun wisdom, and art displays of secular ideals were not quite enough to substitute for the worldview-shaping function of religions. The new, new atheism still lacked a grand story worth embracing and working toward. Transhumanism thus emerges as this atheism 3.0 that can tell a story of evolutionary origins and a future bright with promises of transformation. Along the way, the heroes of science valiantly struggle to redirect human evolution through the awe-inspiring technology that will fight off the risk of the global catastrophe that weapons of mass destruction and unchecked climate change threaten. With determination, our foes of sickness, suffering, aging, and death will finally be vanquished. To motivate its followers, still trapped in these weak sacks of bodily flesh, Transhumanist art portrays the glorified post-human in ethereal rays of light in a fashion not unlike traditional depictions of the Christian transfiguration. As a pseudo-religious atheism 3.0, this contemporary transhumanism not only offers a secular reinterpretation of Orthodox Christianity, it also revives and upstate, updates old theological heresies for its purposes. In particular, the Protestant theologian Brent Waters 
argues that transhumanism revives two major influential early church heresies. First, transhumanism's radical anthropological dualism harkens back to the Manichaean disdain for the body as an obstacle to fulfillment. Waters insists that the warring eschatological visions of Christianity and transhumanism are not only theoretical visions, questions, but also have serious ethical repercussions. The bare, atomized self is left untethered from the mutual dependence and relational responsibilities of vulnerability that arise naturally from our finite embodiment. The body is treated as an extrinsic tool of the person and a weak one at that. It ought to be brought into submission to the individual self-will and drastically altered when biotechnological opportunities present themselves. Moreover, a society convinced of the transhuman vision will be disinclined to value the dignity of the human person's corporality, the meaning of his human sexuality as an expression of interpersonal love, and the procreation of children as supreme gifts of such love. Doctors will be open to performing mutilating surgeries if they support the life project of the patient. Second, the constant striving for perfection through human self-improvement, apart from God, recalls the Pelagian neglect of humanity's need for grace to overcome sin and grow in virtue. Such neo-Pelagianism fosters a eugenic impulse wherein individuals conscientiously take up their responsibility for humanity's steady improvement. Those who lack the physical and mental characteristics that transhumanists prize and who have little prospect of benefiting from the available aids become obstacles to a better earth. Waters explains the connection between a theoretical neo-Pelagianism and an ethical neo-eugenics as follows, quote, alarmingly, Pelagians of every age often appeal to medical rhetoric to achieve the perfection they envision. Is it not a concern for public hygiene that inspires eugenic programs to sanitize the race and inhibit the birth of those who would infect it? If the posthuman exemplifies the triumph of the will, then there is an accompanying and inescapable logic of the necessity of eliminating or preventing that which is judged to stand in the way of its final and perfect culmination." Unquote. In a vision in which universal human dignity is the holdover from outdated religious traditions, the physically and mentally disadvantaged will be removed for the good of a man-made technolog technological salvation. Sloppy and unpredictable conventional sexual reproduction will give way to more rationally controllable methods of in vitro fertilization and embryo selection to craft the next generation of children with a better chance of having better characteristics and hence a better life. And if you want a, a good articulation of this view, you can see uh, Julian Savalescu's work in his Principle of Procreative Beneficence. The sacrifice of hosts of inferior embryos is considered an acceptable price to pay for the increased possibility of a fitter, happier generation. Now, perfect bliss might still be out of reach, but maybe, just maybe, our smarter and kinder and fitter children will discover how to finally live forever. The secular transhumanist movement thus lives with the hopeful expectation of a yet unseen singularity of human-machine blending. Ultimately, digital immortality will bring definitive liberation from the plight of the body and future glorification that comes with the advent of the post-human. But this project for an earthly paradise for progressive disembodiment requires of the movement's adherence what some call the ultimate leap of faith. Yet as the bioethicist Pascal Corby notes, quote, even if many of its imaginative prospects do not eventuate, it demands a response here and now. For our hopes and aspirations define who we are." Unquote. Such post-human goals are indeed shaping the hopes of many for the future, and thus guiding the use of large sums of money, time, and energy. No matter how fantastic the ideas may seem, 
they need to be addressed with rigor to prevent disappointing dreams from creating real-life nightmares. So it seems a problematic anthropological dualism undergirds this hope in an earthly paradise of disembodied liberty through digital immortality. Widespread neglect of human animality misunderstands the body as an extrinsic instrument of a detached consciousness. One of the proposed transhumanist paths to immortality, whole brain emulation, can be viewed as an advanced version of the old teletransportation project to move psychological states from one substrate to another. According to Bostrom, quote, the basic idea is to take particular, a particular brain, scan its structure in, in detail, and construct a software model of it that is so faithful to the original that when run on appropriate hardware, it will behave in essentially the same way as the original brain, unquote. Now, such a vision implies a view in which one's mental life is ultimately reducible to these sets of physical processes. However, the pretense of preserving human identity through the information of psychological consciousness seems unable to overcome a standard duplication objection. So once the beliefs, the memory, character information, and intentions of subject A are stored, A's psychological state can supposedly be moved to various distinct substrates. We can call B and C, for instance. If personal identity is reducible to this stored psychological state, then B and C are both the same persons as A. However, as B and C continue to live their lives after the teletransport process that gave them the information of A, each will acquire new beliefs, memories, characteristics, and intentions that would seem to distinguish B and C. Yet since both B and C are identical to A, they must also be identical to each other. Supposed identical copies would each develop unique sets of memories, desires, intentions, and traits that would actually distinguish them as distinct individuals according to this theory. It seems that the teletransportation project in whatever form leads to unavoidable contradiction. In transporting a physical brain or the data gathered from uh, neuronal information, assuming such a procedure is possible, one might convincingly replicate an individual without preserving him in existence. As John Cyril has noted, a perfect scientific simulation of the various elements of the photosynthesis process will not actually produce the real sugar found in plants. In a similar way, the simulation of the material elements involved in human consciousness does not guarantee that such a simulation will successfully function in the same way that humans do. Such transfers produce qualitative, qualitatively similar copies, but fail to maintain an identical personal identity. Process could offer an intriguing historical compilation of data related to the thoughts and feelings of the departed human being without necessarily preserving that person in existence. Furthermore, our human experience of sense knowledge brings us in direct contact with an inescapable animality. The external stimulation of sense organs seems to explain human sensation better than the mere appeal to mental states. If the knower is ultimately only experiencing interior mental states, then he loses grounds for asserting that he is in contact with exterior objects assumed to cause the sensation. The philosophers Patrick Lee and Robert George pose the epistemological bridge problem of the mental state view of sensation as follows, quote, if what I di directly sense or perceived is, only, is always only a mental state, then how could I ever have a good reason to believe that there even is an external cause of these mental states, unquote. There seem to be no weighty grounds in such a model to distinguish knowledge of the external world from a private hallucination. The experience of passivity and sensations is also best accounted for by this external stimulus of the sense organs. Sensation, the individual receives input that moves him. Only in subsequent stages is there an active selection and interpretation of the sense data received. The mental state view of human sensation leaves unexplained how a material being, external objects of sensation, 
could impact a non-material being, the interior mental state. Yet, if one holds instead to an Aristot in an Aristotelian manner that the sensible object acts on or informs the enlivened or ensouled sensed organ, the problem disappears. In addition, human perceptions are best explained through the action of bodily organs. For example, death perception depends upon two physical eyes aligned closely but separately. The sensed object is also received as internally characterized by spatial location that provides an orientation so that what is known is the physical effect that the object has on the physical subject. Further, the experience of the unique shape, temperature, and texture of an object that touch provides seems sensory bound. The perspective entailed in human sensation indicates that the knower encounters not just the quality of some external object, nor a wholly subjective mental experience. Instead, he experiences precisely the sensed object in relation, in the relation it creates to him by acting upon him. Since sensation is a bodily act, it demands a bodily subject. Thus, human sensation indicates that the person is an essentially animal being and not a mind that happens to dwell in a deta detachable bodily instrument. Moreover, the acts of human judgment manifest that the different capacities needed for sensation and understanding are unified in a single subject. Lee and George use an example, a simple affirmation such as this is a tree or that is a tree can be analyzed into a subject predicate pair known by a single knowing person. While the proposition's predicate tree is a universal concept grasped through abstract understanding, the proposition's subject, that, is a particular referent, in this case, a tree, that is a concrete instantiation of treeness. Known through sensation, the I, the subject that understands and is self-aware, is the same being who also senses the tree. Since a sensing agent is an intrinsically bodily being, as just discussed, it is reasonable to affirm that the same I, who also understands, is an intrinsically bodily being. The person's dependence upon sensation for human cognition also shows the human agent's essential bodiliness. While the spiritual activity of conceptual knowledge is intrinsically independent of matter, Human experience of such conceptual knowledge is always mediated through prior sense knowledge of individuals from which universals are abstracted. The intelligible pattern of the concept is discovered in sensory experiences that specify what type of concept is discovered in any given agent. The sense knowledge specifies and does not merely occasion intellectual knowledge for the human being. This tie between spiritual acts and bodily sensation implies that the spiritual acts principle, soul, is, is incomplete apart from the body to which it is intrinsically ordered. Further, the constant return to the concrete in knowledge suggests that the human person's spiritual dimension is intimately connected to his animal aspect. As noted above, the intellectual act entails the abstract understanding of some feature of a concrete thing that is common to a class of beings. Moreover, to understand the universal characteristic as realized in this or that particular being requires sense knowledge, either a perception of the currently pre present individual or a sense memory of the past individual. Therefore, the complete act of understanding external objects demands a psychophysical unity in the person as a knowing subject. Contemporary studies of embodied cognition seem to support such perennial philosophical insights. There's also an ironic shift in robotics away from the older ideal of disembodied AI consciousness. Research suggests that information processing improves when robots have sensors and movements that grant access to their surroundings. Moreover, the reduction of mental activity to the brain too simplistically ignores the organ's dependence on other bodily dimensions of the person. For example, emotions are lived as a holistic experience of the human organism, which include almost all subsystems of the body. Central and peripheral nervous system, hormonal system, heart, circulation, respiration, uh, facial and gestural experience, expression muscles. 
Neurons are involved, but do not account fully for the lived emotional experiences that permeate the whole person. As Calvin Mercer and Ronald Cole Turner note, quote, the buzz of activity in the brain entails input-output interaction with processes ongoing in the rest of the body. The, 10, the 100 trillion bacteria living in our gut can cause depression and anxiety. With neurons, chemical transmitters, and microbiotic entities, we are a surging hormonal package, unquote. This deep relationship between such processes suggests that the human person cannot be confined to brain information or isolated from a structural unity as a living animal. Instead, consciousness is better understood in terms of the relationship between the whole organism and the world, rather than as some sort of localizable reality. Further, we can look at cognitive linguistics that starting to uncover the universal metaphors that shape human communication are subtly grounded in common embodied experiences. Our mental life, then, is linked to the concrete fleshiness of the body. In addition, contemporary ethics are often sensitive to our narrative nature, whereby we form pictures of the good life that attract us to ideals the way that mere information could not. Yet such pictures are themselves embedded in rituals that constantly engage the body. Once again, the disembodiment ideal that drives transhumanist aspirations fails to account for key dimensions of human existence. Now, any defense of, or this defense of humanity's intrinsic animality against tendencies to separate the person from the body should not be misconstrued as a physicalist reduction of the human being. Although other animals might see the similarities between a group of particulars, the human being's conceptual understanding brings him to the natures that unite instantiations of classes. Such a distinction between the human and non-rational grasping of similarities is especially notable when human beings capture shared features among individuals whose sensory appearances are strikingly different. Since the term of, intellectu of the intellectual act is a non-physical content that goes beyond the constraints of temporal physical particularity, it is reasonable to conclude that the intellectual act of understanding is itself non-physical. A non-physical act implies a non-physical power or capacity, as intellectual acts point to an aspect of the human being that is non-reducible to the physical, in other words, to a spiritual dimension. The spiritual, non-physical capacity that grounds conceptual knowledge makes sense of the many manifestations of unique human accomplishments. As Lee and George summarize, quote, syntactical language, art, architecture, variety in social groupings and in other customs, burying the dead, making tools, religion, fear of death, and elaborate defense mechanisms to ease living with that fear, wearing clothes, true courting of the opposite sex, free choice, and morality, all of these and more stem from the ability to reason and understand, unquote. Such behaviors are consistently evident in a diversity of ways throughout human history and cultures. Human beings experience a rich interior life wherein they can self-reflect and position themselves within the surrounding world. They are animals who can, as knowing subjects, make themselves the object of their knowledge. The person not only knows, he knows himself as a knower. Yet only a non-physical capacity unbound by particularity could it turn in on itself for critical self-analysis. So the philosophical reflection upon the human person's actions and nature traced in this section of the presentation indicate that he is an essentially bodily organism, even if we maintain this spiritual dimension. His bodily dimension is not an obstacle to his perfection. In fact, his body cannot be dispensed with or overcome through technology without dispensing with the complete human person. The transcendence of the person's animality inevitably comes at the expense of full humanity. Thus a profound and tragic contradiction seems to rest at the mind uploading project. Namely, the project purports to preserve human beings by acts that deny what is essential to their humanity. Transhumanists are correct to seek human immortality but wrong to expect it through digital means. Section one of this work explored the surprising ways in which secular transhumanism apes orthodox and heretical Christianity. 
Section two showed that the misunderstandings about human identity drive transhumanists to misdirect their energy on projects that can only preserve, at best, a replica of the dead. This final section argues that a deeper recovery of the mimicked Christian tradition can reorient transhumanist dreams for radical transformation and guide the prudent incorporation of biotechnological tools into a larger project of pursuing the good life. While the promised transhuman tra terrestrial paradise is beyond our reach, the quest for immortality found in many transhumanist authors points toward authentic transcendence. The effort to quantitatively extend man's days on Earth is an imperfect distortion of the call to a qualitatively superior form of unending life. The discomfort with imperfection that motivates transhumanists to thrust beyond human limitation and recalls that the human per recalls that the human person often discovers her capacity for greatness precisely in experiencing her indigency. As Giacomo Lorovici observes, quote, unlike man, when the animal satisfies its own needs, it does not experience the disappointment of the objective achieved. Therefore, man is not a specialized animal, simply equipped with a more complex range of needs, but is directed beyond the occasional satisfaction of his own needs, unquote, toward a higher, perhaps even, we could say, infinite good. The frustrating incapacity of the current life to satisfy the person hints that she was made for more than this temporal existence can offer. While biotechnology may assuage some of the afflictions that plague life and give a better chance to develop many of our capacities, a mere prolongation of earthly existence seems inadequate to address the person's persistent pursuit of bliss. Such yearnings for immortality beyond the current temporal existence encourage the search for a transcendent reality capable of satisfying such stubborn longings. As Corby observes, quote, to settle for more of the same is a refutation of our human greatness, a denial of our capacity for God, unquote. Hence, the secular vision of the transhumanist will actually hinder them from achieving the very immortality they seek as part of their enhancement projects. A philosophy open to the transcendent and the human person's spiritual nature is needed to escape the narrow constraints of the movement's positivism. The thirst for the infinite does not by itself demonstrate the existence of an infinite being. However, such thirst does prompt the person to explore the possibility that such a being exists and strongly signals that any effort for imminent happiness through finite objects is doomed to disappointment. The transhumanist projects are dissatisfactory not because they seek too much, but rather because they seek too little. Technological improvements in the human person's bodily dimensions can be helpful in the search for happiness, but are insufficient for achieving the lofty goal of flourishing. Now, for all the deformations of Christian thought that drive secular transhumanist pursuits, Catholics need not abandon the project of human biotechnical enhancement as inevitably doomed to depravity. Nonetheless, they will need to creatively repropose the Catholic patrimony's reflection on human flourishing to move beyond certain stalemates in secular bioethical debates about the relationship between emerging technologies and human identity. For instance, both bioconservative critics of enhancement and transhumanist enthusiasts for biotechnical boosts agree upon the importance of promoting the subject's pursuit of authenticity. Yet critics perceive of such technologies as a threat to achieving authenticity, while proponents see them as assisting us to become more authentic. Bioconservatives would tend to work principally within what the bioethicist Eric Perens describes as a framework of gratitude for gifts of nature given. For instance, Leon Cass extols the value of human finitude and contends that technological interventions often rob people of their freedom to exercise their individuality. 
Francis Fukuyama is especially interested in preserving universal human rights and fearful that biotechnical developments will create situations of inequality that could undermine liberal democracy. Likewise, Michael Sandel warns against an erosion of human agency in which the person is treated as a machine to be tweaked and loses his chance to exercise the free choice of the good and the noble task of overcoming challenges. Transhumanist, on the other hand, would work principally through what Perrins calls a framework of creativity that privileges the, person the person's responsibility to harness human capacities to shape the world and ourselves for the better. The given is merely the starting point and deserves no special reverence. Fearful attachment to the human status quo stifles human self-expression and blocks the promises of a better future. The bioethicists Michael Burdett and Victoria Lorimar proposed that the theological categories of creaturehood and deification could provide greater insight into the right use of emerging technologies than a merely sociological focus on authenticity. The theologians recognize that both bioconservatives and transhumanists work within a secular mentality without any clear adherence to either of the proposed classifications. Nonetheless, there are affinities for one or the other theological poles in the two secular approaches. With its forceful protection of the finitude of humanity, the bioconservatives show regard for human creaturehood. The urgency for fundamental human change in transhumanism manifests the movement's implicit sympathy for deification. Unfortunately, both bioconservative and transhumanist approaches suffer the limits of a worldview rooted in what the authors describe as, quote, divorce between concept of God and concepts of humanity and nature, unquote. Reflections on a metaphysically grounded human teleology would offer new insights into biotechnology's role in human progress. In particular, we could propose, perhaps daringly, that the traditional doctrine of theosis could elevate desires for human transcendence to a goal more satisfying than illusory attempts at a digital destiny. While the transhumanists promote quite fantastic plans for future evolution, Christianity has an even longer tradition of bold claims. For the Catholic tradition, salvation is not primarily a pathway to God, it is a process by which humans become God, uh, according to Ronald Cole Turner. However, unlike transhumanism, Christian divinization is not merely human, as if human beings initiated and completed their own transformation. Catholicism also adds to the standard secular accounts of augmentation and enhancement a unique possibility of divine elevation for all members of society, not only for those who can afford certain resources of biotechnology. Many uneducated men and women, including a slave like Felicity and a teenage martyr like Agnes, appear in the Roman canon of the Mass and recall God's capacity to raise up to the heights of divine life those on the margins of society. As Andrew uh, Pinsent and Sean Biggins write, quote, such saints are certainly regarded as having received divine enhancements, but principally in terms of gifts for their spiritual and moral fruitfulness, with its source and goal being the love of God, unquote. So the greatest evil is not subpar intelligence or even the tragic loss of physical and cognitive functioning but rather a freely chosen sin that breaks the bond of fruitful friendship with God. The believer can hope that like the wounds of the risen Christ, even defects of the body of all kinds are sustained for the sake of divine love in this present world and can contribute to a person's glory in eternity. Thus, the physical and mental limitations technology fails to correct or overcome in this life can still find meaning in the Catholic perspective, as crosses united to the Lord and redeemed through his, re his resurrection. Christian creatures are co-creators with the source of life and thus in are entirely justified in using technology to improve their earthly sojourn with better bodily functions and even an extended lifespan. 
However, the creaturely awareness of a divine agency beyond the mere march of history opens believers to improvements that are not of their own making and to the possibility of a divine glorification. Thus, creatures bound for glory recognize the contributions that technology might make for an improved futurum while acknowledging that adventus is accomplished by divine grace alone. And these are categories that Burdett and Lorimar uh, develop in their reflections. While futurum is an organic development of prior states, adventus entails the gratuitous intervention of an outside force that upsets expectations. The balance of the creaturehood and deification poles means that a simple yes or no to bioethical enhancements is not possible. Instead, such enhancements take their fitting place. They are neither categorically prohibited nor imperative. Like other applications of technology, they become the subject of ethical deliberation. In such a vision, divine and human agency is complementary rather than competitive. Since God utterly transcends, transcends the realm of changing finite being, his primary causality sustains without replacing the secondary causality of creatures. He is not merely a stronger, faster, superior member of the created order, but is rather the very author and sustainer of the order to which he is not restricted. The creator's non-competitive collaboration with creatures in the natural order also extends to the supernatural order of sanctification and divinization. Thus, we might propose that the Thomistic model of healing, elevating, and deifying grace could offer a paradigm that might build upon and expand conversations about the meaning of technology beyond the therapy, enhancement, and transhumanism model that typifies current bioethical discussions. As therapeutic inventions aim to repair damage or correct healthy biological functions, so healing grace repairs the disorders introduced through original sin. As enhancements push humanity to new levels of cognitive, mood, or physical capacities beyond current biological statistical norms, so elevating grace grants individuals the capacity for meritorious actions beyond the possibilities of human nature. As transhumanism strives for a future of unprecedented delight in the wedding of humanity and technology at the singularity, so deifying grace enables the person to enjoy the sublime bliss only accessible in the union of creator and creature in the beatific vision. Biotechnology may assist in removing physical impediments to the exercise of virtue, and perhaps even in improving biological dispositions toward virtue but it can never provide the elevation to a supernatural state found in grace. Nonetheless, the, the technocratic mentality of control associated with transhumanism can still affect the subjective appropriation of grace in particular individuals. While enhancements of various kind are not wrong in themselves, there is the risk that transhumanist transcendence can become an addictive substitute for the transcendence of grace, thereby blocking reception of the actual, actual gift of grace. The technocentric culture gives users the false impression that the chief enemies of sin, suffering, and death can be tamed by humanity, thus deterring them from imploring seemingly superfluous supernatural aid. Just as secular transhumanists can succumb to a technocratic use of technology as tools of boundless manipulation, so theologians in dialogue with transhumanism could possibly succumb to a technologized view of grace that reduces participation in divine life to a mere instrumental solution to sin. And this is a notion that uh, King Ho Leong uh, develops in a recent article. While healing grace does address the problem of sin, a partial vision would neglect the role of elevating and deifying grace ordered to divinization and transforming union. Like the technocratic model of transhumanism, a theological reduction of grace hazards losing sight of human teleology. The retrieval of the full patrimony of the Catholic theology of grace enriches contemporary theological discussions of transhumanism that could be afflicted with too narrow a view of the Christian life. An appreciation for the varied functions of grace also helpfully relativizes the goods of biotechnology without spurning them in sterile condemnations 
or avoiding them out of ungrounded fear. This presentation has highlighted those aspects of Thomistic anthropology most relevant to the quest for radical life extension. It outlined the compelling philosophical grounds for rejecting efforts to seek human improvement through a permanently disembodied state. Given the person's identity as a body-soul composite, the, the person's perfection entails the fulfillment of the full range of bodily and spiritual goods. A dualistic divide between the self and the body could lead to negative consequences in the ethical life. Thus, the resources of Thomistic thought can correct the impoverished anthropology that informs the transhumanist immortality enhancement projects and direct legitimate desires to improve health and lifespan in manners that respect human identity. Moreover, the secular substitutes for salvation found in transhumanism's eschatology called for a rediscovery of the, trans of the tradition's insights on grace-enhanced life. Reticence about technology's capacity to fulfill the human person is not a rejection of his incessant quest to overcome the challenges and imperfections of the current life. While Christian asceticism maintains its value as a necessary check upon the deviations of concupiscence and vice, such training is understood as a channeling of the human drive toward greatness. Since the creature is bound for glory, it should not be surprising that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Biotechnological advances will likely bring some degree of cognitive mood and physical benefit. If respectful of the dignity of rational animals, then such developments will be praiseworthy moments of progress and aids to flourishing. However, the person would suffer deep disappointment if he expected a more comfortable and longer life to bring rest to his aching heart. Thankfully, we need not dream about 2045 or some other unfulfilled future to begin enjoying, through grace, here and now, the gift of divine transhumanization. Thank you.